So the strike was called, and almost immediately, it shut the area down. The strikes were effective. The mines within 24 hours were not operating at all. In fact, some of them started filling with water because the mines at that time were so deep that they would naturally collect water and they had to run pumps constantly to keep them, the lower levels dry. And they were shut down to the point where even the guys running the pumps wouldn't go into work for fear of crossing one of these. And this is a parade. When we think about picketing nowadays, um, I spent a lot of time in Detroit. When the big three, one of the automakers, would have a strike, you'd see guys carrying picket signs out in front of a plant to keep that plant from operating. The parades during 1913 are a little different because how do you pick at all these different locations? As you drive around the QAnon, I'm sure you've noticed that the copper industry is kind of scattered. There is a mine shaft over here, a smelter over here, a tool shop over here, and so on and so forth. So instead, what they do is they hold these parades in the street, men, women, children, American flags, sometimes bands, and they would march to show solidarity, but also they would do this around the shift change. So if you were going to get up that morning and go to work, Knock yourself out, but you've got to walk by these people to do it. And so there'd sometimes be confrontations between people who are willing to cross the picket lines and the people who are actually on the picket lines out the streets to discourage you from going to work. One of the most famous people involved in the strikes, Big Annie Clements, and uh, we'll talk quite a bit about her tonight, and we'll talk about Joanne, who did some wonderful research on her, and has some pointing at you, so get used to it. <laughs> Big Annie Clements. Um, is well known to many people in this area because they call her Big Annie because she's six foot two. I'm six one and a half, so she's got a half inch on me to begin with. But she was married to a mine worker, and he almost never pops up in the story. She does, because very early on in the strike, she took a leadership role. She somewhere went out and found a 10 foot flagpole and a gigantic American flag. And she would lead parades with her gigantic flagpole and her American flag. And the journalists loved her. And if you think about it, you're a journalist, you come up from Chicago or Milwaukee, and you're talking to these miners about the working conditions, and all of a sudden you've got this striking woman who's taller than all of them, and she's boldly leading the strikers. She became the Joan of Arc of Calumet. So Big Annie's extremely important. And this is an interesting photograph. You'll notice the National Guardsman behind her. And she's also got her right hand is bandaged. And there's a famous incident where she's leading some strikers outside of Red Jacket, which is what Kelly was called at the time. And the National Guardsmen, who'd been called up uh, shortly after the strike was called, um, were opposing them and trying to stop them. And there was a little confrontation between the two groups. There's testimony taken later on this. So we can confirm a lot of what happened. But somewhere along the line, a guardsman knocked the flag out of her hands with his saber. And famously, she picked the flag up and said something to the effect of, you can go ahead and run me through with your saber, but if this American flag can't protect me, nothing can. And the guardsman denied that that had even happened, except that there was sworn testimony later that it did happen. And we have this photograph, and her finger is bandaged, and that's quite possibly because she'd been hit in the hands with a saber. Uh, she's obviously no worse than the wear, but uh, it does kind of confirm that it happened. Standing next to her is a guy named Ben Goggin, and Ben Goggin is another good symbol of what was going on with the strike. If you look at this community, there's a lot of Finns in the community. Obviously, Leto is a Finnish name. There's other groups up here, though, as well, the Croatians, the Italians, the Hungarians. One of the things that mine management was convinced of was that these disparate groups could never get together and work as a single unified group. And so the Western Federation of Miners is very good. One of the things they did is they'd actually go out and find organizers in different languages. So I might get up and give a speech in English to the English speaking workers and say, you know, here's why we need to band together. And then after me might get up, Big Annie, and give the same speech in Slovenian or Croatian. And then of course Ben Godin would get up and give the same speech in Italian. And so they did a very good job of getting this tower of battle together and holding them together during the strike. The union held together very well during the strike. Ben God is a fascinating character, though, arrested nine times during the strike and only convicted one time. And the only time he was convicted was when he was out of town. And his attorneys cut a deal with the prosecutor and said, in essence, he's not here. If we plead guilty, can we just pay a fine and have it over with? And they said, fine, go ahead. 
He was testifying before Congress in 1914 and was asked specifically about the nine arrests. And they said, what were you arrested for? And he said, nothing. And they said, well, you must have been arrested for something. And he said, well, one day I went to the post office to pick up my mail, and I encountered a strike breaker who punched me in the face, and then he arrested me. And that was one of the arrests for which he was uh, later not convicted of anything. But that's the kind of things that these strike organizers put up with uh, during the battle. But you notice that, again, he doesn't look too worse to wear either. Uh, but that was the cost of doing business as far as he was concerned.